Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I am so excited to share with you our general Sunday school lesson overview. On behalf of our pastor, Dr. Backus, our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all the officers and members at Friendship, thank you for sharing with us uh, and joining us again. I'm recording this lesson in Rockford, where uh, we have been all week for our, our Baptist General State Convention of Illinois Fall Board Meeting. And I've had the privilege and opportunity to preach up here. So Dr. Back has allowed me to record here. And so uh, that's why we have a different look. And I pray that all goes well technically and that God blesses us with a wonderful lesson. A lesson is taken from the Galat uh, third chapter of Galatians, the 23rd through the 29th verses. And then we'll move into the fourth chapter of Galatians, verses 1 through 7. And it's entitled, Free to Live a Mature Life. Our key verse is Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. And it says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And this lesson is really hoping to encourage us, building on the last two or three lessons that we've had when we've talked about uh, recognizing the freedom that we have uh, through our relationship with Jesus Christ and our opportunity to no longer be bound by the law, but to operate in the full fullness of our faith. And so today's lesson, first, we will examine the fullness of freedom that Jesus brings and gives to each believer. Secondly, we will celebrate the inheritance that God gives to each and every one of his children that believe in him. And third and finally, we will commit to living a life of freedom and faithfulness as we go about our day-to-day -day actions. And so we'll begin with prayer and we'll jump into this lesson again. I thank you for bearing with us in the different look and it is our prayer that everything goes well so that we can have a wonderful, wonderful lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and another opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you for the gift of salvation that you've given to us through faith in your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to recognize the sacrifice that you made when you sent him and the sacrifice that he made when he gave his life. Help us to accept the gift of salvation and allow it to permeate our hearts, our minds, our actions, our words, that all that we do bring you glory. Now, Father, we ask that you bless each and every believer and unbeliever alike that might be sharing or watching with us today, that you strengthen us in our road of salvation, that you draw us out of darkness and into your marvelous light, that you bring us into a rested assurance that we are better off with you than without you, and that you have us uh, grow in our saving knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ, and the work that he did in getting out of the grave, defeating death for our sins. Now, uh, bless all that I say and do according to your purpose. In your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so, again, we're in the book of Galatians, uh, widely accepted as Paul's first epistle. It was written to a predominantly Gentile church that struggled with their misunderstanding of their relationship with the Old Testament law. They looked at the way that they lived their lives, and they looked at the way that the law called for them to live, and they thought that something was missing in their faith. And Paul, when he hears about what's going on, he writes this letter to them and he says, listen, you got to stop worrying about what people think about you. You got to stop worrying about what you are or what you aren't. Just have faith in Jesus Christ and let that faith guide you along your faith journey and stop trying to be what the world tells you you need to be. So this third chapter, it really focuses on the defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter four, it begins to talk about the freedoms. And so that's really where our lesson is. It's broken into four parts. Not a terribly long lesson, but I believe it will encourage us and strengthen us as we seek to kind of deal with some of these concepts. So the first part of our lesson is entitled The Connection to Christ. It's taken from Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. The text reads, But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. So in this first part of our lesson, Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25, Paul declares that we were imprisoned by the law. And it really talks about the effects that the law had on us. If we remember the Old Testament law, it was so many things laid out through the book of uh, Leviticus, what you could and what you could not do. And it really dictated the way of life uh, for, the, uh, for the Jew, for the Israelite. Uh, what the law actually showed is that no one was able to be perfect, that everyone would make mistakes, that we would all stumble. And as we look throughout the history of the Old Testament and we look throughout the history of the Israelite people, their 
disobedience caused them to find themselves in trouble time and time again, not only with their enemies, but also with God. And because of their disobedience, God took away the blessings that he had given them, and he allowed them to fall into captivity. He allowed them to be defeated in battle. He allowed all types of problems to happen, not only as a nation, but even individually, as we see some of the things that David went through and Solomon went through because of their disobedience. And so the problem with the law was not that it didn't point out what to do, but in its pointing out what to do, it revealed our inability to do it. And so when we were literally imprisoned by the law, it had us bound. It had us in chains because it held us back from being free by revealing our worst mistakes. We were restricted by its rules and we were limited in reach by its unobtainable goals. Uh, The law really showed us what we could not reach. And it showed us the necessity for something more. Uh, One of the things that I really struggled with academically was there were some classes where I had to realize that no matter what I did, there was going to be no way for me to get 100% A. And I just didn't think that that was fair. As I strive to be my best academically, I want to get the best grade that I can get. And I'm proud to uh, show Dr. Backus, to show Christy, my wife, to show my friends and family that I'm taking my academics seriously and getting all A's. But I really struggle because there are some classes that no matter how hard I try, I'm gonna make a mistake, I'm gonna make a grammatical error, I'm gonna get something wrong on a quiz or a test. But that doesn't mean I stop trying for it. What it does is it reveals to me that even though I'm doing well academically, there's still more work to be done, there's still more studying to be done, there's still more extra, extra effort that I could put forth to even do better. And perhaps it's a weak uh, comparison because if I did study the best that I could and really interpreted the material as well as I should have, maybe I would get a perfect percent, but it's almost unattainable. And that's really what the law has proven to be in the life of a believer, that it's not something that we avoid or something that we just give up on, but the longer we pull and push towards it. The longer we, we we strive to be our best, the more we realize that mistakes will happen in our life. And so our faith is revealed because the law points us to God. The law shows us that we within our own capacity and ability are not able to heal ourselves, to achieve that right position with God through obedience. And so the law reveals that there's a need for something more if we want to be right with God. And so it prepares us to go to God based on a necessity on being incomplete and unfulfilled. I want to be right. I want God to look at me and and smile. I want God to be happy with my living, but the law shows me that that's impossible. And so I don't give up on the law and turn my back on the law, but the law points me towards Christ and it reveals to me the necessity of Christ in my life. And so our faith in God, which is revealed by the law, it justifies us before God. And so I'm no longer justified by my acts of obedience, or I'm no longer trying to be justified by walking on the right side of the line. But I recognize that because I'm unable to be perfect, I put my faith in someone that perfects my work, that literally comes behind me and fixes it every single time. Uh, And so my faith grants me salvation because my faith is no longer in myself, but in someone else. Uh, I, I consider myself a, 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 a sports fan, and I, I've played many sports growing up. I've been on some really good teams and some really bad teams, had some winning seasons and some bad seasons. Uh, but my freshman year uh, in high school, in the middle of the semester, we had a transfer in named Devon Booth. He was a freshman with me, but he was just built for football. And I remember uh, the varsity team, like his first day in practice, he was already on varsity. But the rules said that uh, you can play on the far south team for two quarters and still play the full varsity game. And so every game in the first half, our coach would allow him to play with the far south team. And we just knew if we can just get him the ball, if we could put the ball in his hands, the chances are that he was going to score or at least get us a first down. And so in our own inabilities, we recognized that we were limited. 
chances were that we weren't going to store the ball. Chances were that we weren't going to move the ball, get first downs, because all the talented players were playing on varsity. But those few quarters when we had Booth and a couple other guys playing with us, we knew if we can just get the ball in their hands, that not only would they be able to push us forward a little bit, but where we were falling short, where we were incomplete, they would be able to carry us past the goal line. And that's really the work of Christ. It's not that we're giving up, or that, not that we're not trying. We still strive to do what God calls us to do and be the people that God has called us to be. But instead of depending on our own work, we trust that when we do our best, we pass the ball off or hand it to God, to Jesus Christ, and then he does the rest. And so it's not that it's not us achieving or trying to be right and then telling Christ, you take it from here. But it's us recognizing that because Christ has done the work for us, we don't need to give up on being righteous, but we can trust in him to complete our righteousness as we strive to be more pleasing in the sight of God. So our faith has graduated us and moved us from under the tutelage of the law, and we're now under the work of Christ through our faith in him. And we look at this place of progression, that as non-believers, even for the Gentiles and the Jews, as before Christ was in our lives, regardless of where we stand ethnically or culturally, before Christ was in our lives, we were under the tutelage of the law. And that's not only the biblical law and the Old Testament law, but even the law of the world, that we did what we thought would be right. We did what the laws told us we should do. We followed the rules and we tried our best to be right. But in that effort, it was revealed to us our own in, uh, uh, inefficiency, our own failure to do what God had taught us to do and be who God had taught us to be. And so now like a graduating student, we no longer rely on our tutor. We no longer rely on the law, but we live by the lessons that we've learned. And so the law has guided us and taught us when we did not know better. But now that we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we no longer lean on the law. We no longer trust in the law to make us whole or to make us righteous. But we use that law as a guide as we seek to move forward in Christ. And so we looked at the connection in Christ. That's Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. Now we look at a noble example. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28 reads, For you, all, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So our worth uh, to God is no longer based on our obedience. Obedience is no longer the measuring stick, but rather it's the product. And I keep using that example for at least the last three weeks now, that our obedience is not what justifies us. Our obedience is not what qualifies us. Our obedience does not open up the door. When we have faith, we are allowed in, but our obedience is a product of our faith. It's evidence of, a, it's the outward product of an inward choice. And so uh, it's like going to a family reunion. My value to the family does not get me in. My last name gets me in, regardless if I'm the best uncle or the worst uncle, regardless if I'm the best cousin or the worst cousin, regardless if I've accomplished the most or accomplished the least, regardless if I contributed the most or cost the family the most, just by sake of last name, I have access. But because of the access and because of the joy and my respect and my appreciation for the work that my family has done for me and the sacrifices they made for me, I now in turn try to be the best family member I can be to show not only my value to my family, but my family's value to me. And so when we look at our relationship with Christ, just because of our relationship, we have now have access to God. But we don't give up on being obedient or being righteous. We now use that obedience as a, and righteousness as an external product of what is happening on the inside. So uh, an absence of obedience does not necessarily uh, mean an absence of faith, but rather it's just a bad moment. And that's what we have to come to terms with as believers, that we will have bad days, that we will have bad moments, but we don't have to rest in those bad moments. We don't have to return to those bad moments. When we slip, when we stumble, when we fall, those things will happen, but it's up to us to use and depend on our faith and trust in the guidance of the Holy Spirit to move from a place where we're stuck 
in those bad moments and not give up every time a mistake happens. If we look at just the wine, wine making process, some of the best vineyards in the world, mostly in Burgundy, France, they sometimes have bad years and they produce bad or no wine at all. But you don't tear down the grapevines and burn it all down, but rather you try again the next year and learn from the mistakes that have been made in the past. And that's what we do when we seek out their obedience and righteousness, not to qualify or justify us before God, but to show us proof and evidence of our faith. It's recognizing that we don't have to rest in those bad moments, but we can recognize that even when those bad moments happen, we dust off our feet, we ask God for forgiveness, we repent, turn away from those things and turn to God, and then we try to be better the next day than we were the day before. So Paul reminds us that all believers receive the same gift and the same promise. And this evidence is proven by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Each and every believer, the moment that we believe, not at baptism, not when we start giving, not when we are voted in our churches, but the moment that we believe we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, which means that God places his spirit inside of us. It's the same spirit that Jesus Christ prayed that God would send us to comfort us and guide us until Christ returned. And so our relationship with God is now unique because we don't earn our way through him, uh, to him through obedience, but rather we are presented to him through our bond with his son based on our faith. And so the gift of the Holy Spirit marks us as a child of God. And God is now able to accept us because instead of trying to earn our way in front of him through obedience, we are now presented. And I, I know this is a pretty uh, worldly example, but I was watching a, 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 a mob YouTube video. And in the video, the guy was saying that as a mob member, you couldn't just walk up to another mob member and speak. But someone that knew both of you all had to introduce you and say, he's a friend of mine. And because that one guy knew both of you and said that you all should meet, he's a friend of mine, you knew that his word guaranteed your status or made you worthy to have that conversation, even though you knew nothing about them personally. And that's the work that Christ does for us. On our own, we can't just go to God. We're not good enough and our lives are not clean enough. But because of the work of Christ and our faith in him, when we go to God, Jesus stands in the middle and he, he's our lawyer. He's our advocate. He advocates on our behalf and he reminds God, I paid the price for his sins. He's a friend of mine. He's a believer in me and therefore we're a child of God. And so by putting on Christ, by putting our faith in Christ, we place our trust in him and we depend on him for power and the ability to work through and by our faith rather than chase after obedience through works. And so now our faith in Christ gives us access to God because we no longer trust in our own ability, but we depend on the ability of Christ and his work on the cross. And now and Paul uh, then moves forward and he starts to address the division that is obviously in the church. Again, we've talked about this division. And he says that male and female, he talks about Jew and Gentile. Uh, he talks about uh, uh, Roman and Greek, uh, excuse me, uh, Greek and Jew. There, there are just so many divisions that were popping up in this emerging church, mostly because of uh, the, the Christian believers that were of Jewish faith recognized that the Gentile believers were missing some things according to the Old Testament law. And believers had convinced themselves that because their faith or their practice of their worship did not resemble others who they looked up to or respected or been around a long time, that there must be something missing in their life. And the worst thing that we can allow the enemy to do is come into our faith and convince us that we need more than a relationship with Christ. We can't be drawn into the practices and the traditions of our past once we are found in Christ, because those are the very things that God and Jesus has freed us from. There are things in our life and even in the religions that we practice, the denominations that we are part of, that we can't take with us on our journey with Christ. That does not mean that they're bad or that they have no place in our lives, but it means that sometimes those very traditions and practices that we cling to and depend on are the actual hindrances that prevent us from moving forward and becoming the body of Christ that God wants us to believe in. I've seen people be turned off because someone didn't stand when the scripture was read or because a woman uh, wore pants in church or because someone stood in the pulpit or sat in the pastor's chair. We must grow to the point where we don't let these small things that have nothing to do with Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins prevent us from moving forward and accepting one another and sharing the bond of Christ and the love of God that lies with each, within each and every one of us. Paul makes it clear the veil has been torn and the division has been taken away 
way that we're all equal. If we're a child of God, we're all equal. I remember growing up, I have a little sister. I'm 40 years old. She just turned 39 about two weeks ago. And at times I was on my best behavior. At times she was on her best behavior. At times I did things to discredit my family. And at times she did things to discredit us. But at no time, regardless of how good or bad we were, no matter how many mistakes we made or how good or how many uh, uh, good things we did, and no times did our parents look at us differently or love us differently. We were all equal, even though I was older and she was younger, even though I was a male and she was female, even though she was probably more advanced academically, I was more, more advanced athletically, even though we had different roles and responsibilities within the church and within our social groups, our parents still loved us equally because we were both equal children of theirs. And that's what Paul is trying to remind this audience in Galatia, that no matter what divisions the world tells you exist between your brothers and sisters in Christ, God does not see them. He sees us all as equal. So we saw the connection to Christ. We looked at the noble example. Now we jump down to the 29th verse, the final verse in chapter 3, and the first through third verses of chapter 4, and we look at a redemption from the curse. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29 reads, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham and heirs according to the promise. And Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 reads, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but it is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of this world. Again, similar from our previous lessons over the last three or four weeks, the theme of being Abraham's seed is shared with all believers, Jews and Gentiles, uh, to show that even though they are different uh, in ethnicity and culture and background, that all believers are equal before God and we all reap the same rewards from our faith. In Paul's uh, explanation, our positions, our ethnicity, and our background play no part in our salvation. But rather, we are judged or accepted by God. We are found uh, worthy of salvation based on our faith in Jesus Christ alone. Do we belong to Jesus Christ? And if we do, then we are saved through our faith in him. And that's all that matters when it comes to salvation. Bringing up the economic culture of the time, Paul shows the difference between the freedom of a child and of a slave. And he talks about that we were the slaves and the heirs. And the reason why he shows that is to show the eventual position that both will have. As a slave, one had freedoms that were greater than that of a child, even though the, uh, there was limited uh, progress and limited hope to rise above your position as a slave. They would almost certainly end their lives in the same position in which they found themselves in now. And there would be little room for progress as a slave. But a child that is an heir, their freedoms would be much more limited to that even of a slave because of their immaturity, because of their age and their adolescence. But one day that same child would be free from the restraints of their childhood and they would become full recipients of the inheritance that has been laid up away for them. In other words, God reveals to us that even though the law limit to, limited us as children, that as heirs of salvation, as recipients of the promise of God, uh, we will one day be free from the law and we will be able to operate in the full freedom of our faith. For the heir is under the law until we mature. And now as full inheritance of God's promise, uh, as being full recipients of the inheritance of God's promise, we can now rest assured in our freedom and operate knowing that we are no longer bound by the law, but free to operate according to our faith. Paul declares that as children, we weren't just slaves to the law, but we were also to the slaves to the world, to the universe and its ways. Our natural minds, they draw us to worldly concepts like payback, like cause and effect, like karma or the concept of you deserve this or someone else deserves that. But these things seem to reveal themselves in a way that the world goes about its day-to-day -day business where uh, eye for eye, things like that. But they have no place in guiding and directing the hearts and the lives of the children of God. When we depend on worldly concepts for life decisions, we limit ourselves and we lock ourselves in the bondage that prevents us from being full recipients of God's promise in our lives. Again, Paul points out that this freedom that we have of turning away from that freedom and embracing the bondage that we have been freed from. Why go back to the very thing that God freed us from only to be limited in its ability to move us according to God's plan. When we are under the law, all it reveals is our shortcomings and our sinful nature. 
But now that we have been free from the law, we are free to operate in the freedom of Christ and be free to live the fullness of his glory and the fullness of his plan for our life. And so now that we have this freedom, Paul does not understand why you would want to return to a place that only reveals what you can never be. So we see the connection to Christ. We looked at the noble example and we just looked at the redemption from the curse. Uh, I'm sorry, we looked at the noble example and uh, we looked at the redemption from the curse. <clears throat> uh, but now we, excuse me, now we end our lesson uh, recognizing uh, in Galatians chapter four, verses four through seven, that uh, we can live in the fullness of God's promise. So Galatians chapter four, four through seven reads, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Amen. So Paul now speaks on God's sovereignty. And he shows how God sent his son Jesus to die for us at the right time. Now, if we understand the, the timing of the Bible for years, thousands of years, the children of Israel have longed for a Messiah, but their disobedience caused them to fall out of favor with God time and time again. And then from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we have what we call a 400 year intertestamental period where the voice of God was silent among his people. And now you have the children of God, some actually convincing themselves that their sinful ways, their disobedience had caused them to fall so far out of favor with God that they were beyond salvation, that they had wasted all uh, whatever favor that they had. But God in his infinite wisdom at the culmination of this intertestamental period saw fit to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. And so when some would have given up, when some believed all hope was lost, God sends his son, Jesus Christ, just in the nick of time. For believers, it's our right to admit and confess that we sometimes become frustrated with God's timing in our lives. But we can all share in the testimony of the songwriter who boldly claimed that God is an on-time God, that he may not come when, he, when we want him to, but he's always on time. Paul talks about the miraculous manner in which Christ was born, that he was born unto a woman, that he was born uh, not involving a man, but he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And we these, these are this is the popular message that was going out uh, during the time of the early church, that Jesus Christ was fully God, was fully man, that he died and got up out the grave in his earthly body with the actual holes in his hands, that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And Paul reinforces these things that people try to... Uh, spiritualized that people try to water down so that the uh, so that the gospel can be more comfortable but paul says the word of god stands true and we're not to change it we're not to dilute it but we're to accept it full and free so paul again he he mentions the miraculous purpose not just the manner in which christ was born but the miraculous purpose in which christ was born that he was born to redeem us or to literally pay the price to set us free from the very law that this church in Galatia is trying to return to. Through that payment of Christ on the cross for our sins, we are now sons of God. We are adopted as extensions to the family, uh, not as extensions, not as extra, not as uh, in the outhouse, but we are full in our membership and full in our equity. We get the same share in the family uh, and there's no separation between us and anyone else. He makes it clear that this salvation, this adoption as sons and daughters, it allows us to be full recipients of the work of Jesus Christ and full recipients of the promise of God and the promise made to Abraham. Paul closes our lesson by recognizing our new position with God through our faith in his son, Jesus Christ. He says that we can now call him Abba or father, which literally translated into daddy. The same way that Christ called on God as Father, we too have the same relationship with God through our faith in Jesus Christ. By giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit, our hearts become filled with the presence of God, and it gives us equal access to the Father. And when we're connected to him through all of eternity because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, this relationship with Christ, it moves us from the bondage of the law and it adjusts or shifts our position in Christ to that of a son and no longer a slave, which means that as a son of God, we are a brother of Jesus Christ. We become heirs of salvation, heirs of the promise of God, and we're no longer an outsider. 
we can all call ourselves children of God, not because of our own works or our own righteousness or our own obedience, but rather because of the work of Jesus Christ and our faith in him. What a wonderful, wonderful lesson. Again, I praise God for each and every one of you. I pray that everything worked out smoothly, that we had a good recording. Again, uh, I want to thank Dr. Backus for allowing me uh, to uh, share this lesson from Rodford, uh, asking God that he continues to give everyone traveling graces with the last of us are coming home from our fall board meeting. And then, of course, as always, I pray for each and every one of you. Those of you that have uh, given your lives to Christ, that God will use these lessons to strengthen us on our road and our faith. And for those of us that are still searching out and looking for understanding that God will break through our hearts, that he will uh, bring us into an understanding of salvation so that we can inherit the gift of eternal life. As always, we encourage you to worship with us in your giving. If you would like to support the work of uh, Friendship Baptist Church, we do have four ways for you to give. You can give on our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462. You can give on Cash App, dollar sign Friendship Chicago. You can mail your check or money order to the church. Friendship Baptist Church, care of Dr. Reginald E. Back is 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. If you don't mind, I would like to give a specific plea. Uh, we're doing a fall festival of fun this coming Tuesday. It's a trick-or-treat Halloween alternative for the kids in our community, but we're just seeking to uh, give them an opportunity to have some fun, to get some candy, and to have a Christian environment, a safe environment, a comfortable environment to fellowship and laugh together. And so we invite you to either come to the church, you can donate, you can bring and drop off candy, but we want to be a blessing to these young people. Uh, and please share the word so that we can get the word out and get as many young people as possible into the church. Uh, for this Halloween alternative uh, fellowship. As always, I'm uh, praying for you. I pray that you pray for me and our church, our pastor, our superintendent. Let's pray for every Sunday school instructor and student throughout all of Christianity. And let's pray that God guide us in our understanding of his word and the way that we live it as we seek to be more righteous before him. Let's dismiss and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and another opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you for all that you have and continue to do. We ask that you help us to recognize the freedom that we have through salvation and faith in your son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you help us to be better today than we were the day before. We ask that you lift us up higher, that we might see you clearer and better understand your will for our lives. Bless each student, bless each person watching and listening. Strengthen us in our faith. Thank you for our pastor, our superintendent, every single Sunday school instructor and student. And thank you for your will in our lives. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. And if the Lord says the same, we'll see you at 11 a.m. on our live worship experience where you'll hear from our own pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Back. God bless. <laughs>